Captain Underpants and the Tyrannical Relation of the Triple Toilet 2000, the 11th epic novel by Dave Pokey. Hi everybody, we're back and as usual we're in big trouble again. This comment will help you get up to speed on our story so far. The truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth about Captain Underpants. Once there was two super awesome kids named George and Harold. He robbed the house and me too. But they had a mean principal named Mr. Krupp. Blah, 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 blah. Mr. Krupp tried to blackmail Jordan Harold. He got you now. So Jordan Harold hypnotized him. I don't think so. They made him think he was Captain Underpants. It was funny at first, but then he took things a little too far. Tra la la! Hey, come back! He got into all sorts of trouble. Then one day he drank some alien superpower juice. And he got real superpowers, which got him into even more trouble. Now, whenever Mr. Krupp hears somebody snap their fingers, snap, he turns into Captain Underpants, tra la la. And whenever anybody pours water on Captain Underpants' head, he turns back into mean old Mr. Krupp, blah blah blah. One time the talking turtle was attacked, yum yum, meet him up. Their, le their leader was the Turbo Toilet 2000. Jordan Harold used a weird machine to make a good robot called the Robo Plunger. The Robo Plunger beat it up the Turbo Tola 2000 and flew him to Uranus. There they have stayed for many months. This other time, Woody Woman made two robots. One of them kicked a kickball into outer space. Could these two events be connected? Our heroes are about to find out because at this very moment, there are traveling backwards in time to discover the terrible truth. Oh no, here we go again. Chapter 1, George and Harold. This is George Beard and Harold Hutchins. George is the kid on the left with the tie and the flat top. Harold is the one on the right with the t-shirt and the bad haircut. Remember that now. If you're confused by what's going on here, don't worry. You're confused too. You see, George Harrow, the Captain Underpants, has just undergone an epic adventure that started out in the dinosaur age and ended after school, 40 years in the future. Now, they have to meet with Neely, the tattletale genius, in his glow-in-the-dark, time-traveling robo-squid suit. They were all hurling backwards in time. Back a long, long, long time ago, to that dull, old-fashioned age known as the present. Oh, I almost forgot. Traveling with them, with three purple and orange speckled eggs laid by their pet Pterodocto crackers who, along with their other pet Zulu the bionic hamster, had just saved the planet and created all life as we knew it, simultaneously. See, that wasn't confusing at all, was it? Melvin's glow in the dark, time-traveling robots twisted west through time in a dazzling array of electrified eye candy at 40 years bed by in reverse. Then everything stopped suddenly. Jordan Harold looked around. Hey, said Harold, we're still at school. Correct, said Melvin. Only it's now 40 years and one day earlier. Hey, look, said George, pointed at the school. There's Tippy and his robot pants. Not again, Harold moaned. moaned. Relax, said Melvin, as a flash of green light shot out of the library window. They're looking at something that happened yesterday. Remember? Oh, yeah, said Harold. We're up there in the library. We just disappeared in the purple potty. Right, said George. And Tippy is just about to come after us. You should be leaving any second now. Suddenly, a crackling blue light shot out of the robo pants, and before you could say convoluted plot line, it disappeared into the noontime haze. Okay, said Melvin. Here you are. Home again, home again, jiggity jig. Take your precious eggs and go about your business. Wait a second, said George. Aren't the cops still after us? Yeah, said Harold. Don't they still think we stole the money from the bank? Not anymore, said Melvin proudly, patting himself on the back with one of his mechanical tentacles. Luckily, I had this glow-in-the-dark time-traveling robot squid suit in my garage. I used it to go back in time and hack into the bank's computer. What for? asked Harold. No big deal, said Melvin. I altered your surveillance images a little bit. Just don't grow a mustache or beard anytime soon, and then you guys will be fine. Wow, said Harold. Melvin's newly rescued, rescued us. I can't believe it. Yeah, I don't get him, Melvin, said George suspiciously. You've always hated us. How come you're being so nice to us 
all of a sudden, oh, I have my reasons, Sir Melvin. I have my reasons. And Melvin did indeed have reasons. One whole year's worth of reasons. But before I can tell you that story, I have to tell you this story. Chapter 2. Don't you hate it when a kickball with Zerans? Somewhere in the deepest, darkest reaches of our solar system, a red rubber kickball was zooming through space. None of us top scientists could explain where it had come from or why it was drifting toward Uranus, but it happened on its present course for the past five and a half books, and nothing could stop it. The kickball spit closer and closer to a small cluster of proclaimed monstrosities that lay together in a heap on the surface of the icy, ridiculously named planet. Behind them, warding them all with a keen, observant eye, was a robotic sentinel known as the Incredible Robo Plunger. Faster and faster, the kickball was toward them until finally, kabloink! The force of the red rubber ball knocked the head right off of the Incredible Robo Plunger. The de decapitated defender jetted toward Slightly as photoatomic transom gobelating yikto fan trip blutonic than the Thomistic juice drizzled out from its mangled neck hole and oozed slowly downward into the gaping mouth of the Turbo Toilet 2000. This was unfortunate because as any robot, as Ice Engineer will tell you, it's very important to keep photoatomic transom gobelating yektu fun shrimp lieutenant that's the Thomistic juice as far away from evil robots as possible. They certainly don't want to get even a drop of it in their mouths for it will only make them come to life and give them an unquenchable appetite for destruction. Which, sadly, is exactly what happened that bleak night on the terribly gassy surface of Uranus. Tribal Toilet 2000's bulbous, bloodshot eyes smacked open and wobbled around wildly. His massive left arms creaked up and rubbed the painful, dropping side of his poor claim lid. What the heck am I, he said, looking around at his fallen alleys. Clumsily, he squeaked to his feet, dusted himself off, and beheld the headless mess that once was the incredible Robo Plunger. Then it all came back to him. The battle, the defeat, the humiliation. It wasn't long before the Turbo Toilet 2000 had pieced together every single event that had brought him and his army of talking toilets to this frozen, frustrating fate. I must retaliate, he said, clenching his razor sharp, proclaimed teeth together tightly. I must avenge my fallen allies. Luckily for him, he was a robot, which meant that he knew a thing or two about mechanical engineering. It didn't take long for him to disassemble the robot plunger, rearrange the pieces, pieces, and create a flying rocket scooter from the recycled parts of his arch enemy. The only thing left to do was to travel the long journey from Iran to Earth. It was a voyage that would take him nearly these whole pages to complete, and when he arrived, he would wage a war against the good people of Earth, a war that would threaten the very foundation where planet. Before I can tell you that story, I have to tell you this story. Chapter 3 Melvin's Moment of Merch Remember back in Chapter 1 where we found out that Melvin had a whole year's worth of reasons why he needed to bring Jordan Harwood and Captain Underpants back to the present? Well, in case you're wondering what happened during that year, here's what happened during that year. Immediately after our heroes disappeared on their prehistoric journey, the cops started looking for George Harvard and Mr. Krupp. Wanted posters appeared in post offices across America. But since George and Harvard and Mr. Krupp had traveled back in time to the Cretaceous period, they were nowhere to be found. Everyone assumed that George Howard and Mr. Krupp had robbed the bank and were hiding out in Canada or Mexico somewhere, and it wasn't too long before the cops gave up and stopped looking for them. It was sad news for most of the residents of Piqua, Ohio, but not for a moment neatly. Melvin was finally happy for the first time in years. No George and no Howard meant no pranks, no comics, and, best of all, no interruptions. Melvin could finally go about conducting scientific experiments creating wild new inventions and indulging his beautiful mind in peace. 
and all that happens only lasts for about two weeks because as we mentioned earlier, you know who showed up. Chapter 4, He Who Must Not Be Flushed. The Turbo Toilet 2000 entered versus the atmosphere in a blazing fireball from the sky. His rocket scooter roared over the rooftop of the small Ohio town of the proclaimed predator bellowed out an eardrum crushing taunt. He's Johnny! Then came the destruction. Buildings collapsed. City, city buses were thrown through skyscraper windows. Fires reached out of control. The chaos and devastation crippled the town, sent residents running for their lives and annoyed the heck out of one little boy. Mavis Neely had been trying to get some work done in his bedroom laboratory when the attack began. All he needed was one or two more hours of uninterrupted silence to complete his experiment, but the terrible ruckus outside was really getting on his nerves. Melvin marched over to his bedroom window, poked his head out, and shouted, Hey, I'm trying to work, you idiot. Be quiet. As you can probably imagine, the Turbo Tola 2000 didn't take too kindly to being dressed down in such a matter. He swiveled his massive bowl around quickly and glared at Melvin with raging, hard-boiled eyeballs. Uh-oh, Melvin gulped. Suddenly, the Turbo Tola 2000 leaped at Melvin. The tiny tattletoe screamed as the malevolent, malevolent miscreant chased him down the street, across the city, and into the empty, darkened hallways of Jerome's Elementary School. When we ran upstairs and hid under Mr. Crow's desk while the Turbo Tola 2000 surged through the classroom for him. When we was in deep trouble. Finally, he actually needed the captain underpass his help. The waistband warrior was nowhere to be found. Rats said Melvin. If only I could. Ouch! Melvin Need was pressing down into something sharp. Carefully, Melvin reached down and pulled the pointy little object out of his knee. It was a toenail. Not just any toenail either. It was one of Mr. Crow's thick, greasy yellow toenails that he had clipped off the day before he had been whisked away on his journey back through time. Ew, what a slob, said Melvin, as he flicked the toenail away. The Melvin thought of something. That Mr. Crow was also Captain Underpants. That meant that Mr. Crow's DNA must have some kind of superpower element in his makeup. If Melvin could find a way to extract a superpower element from Mr. Crow's DNA, Melvin could theoretically transfer the superpowers to himself. Where's that toenail? cried Melvin. Chapter 5 Big Melvin's Returns. The Turbo Toilet 2000 noisily smashed its way from classroom to classroom, getting closer to Mr. Crow's office. And see thundering foot stomp. Melvin desperately searched for the mangy orange carpet for Mr. Crow's stinky toenail, digging his fingers deep into the maddest shack as the sounds of carnage got louder and louder. Where's that toenail? Melvin screamed. Finally, Mr. Crow's office door burst open. Aha! shouted the Turbo Toilet 2000. I've got you now, you annoying little brat. He reached down and grabbed Melvin by the foot and pulled him toward his chomping rear sharp teeth. No, screamed Melvin. I'm too gifted to die. I'm too talented. I'm too... Ouch! Once again, Mr. Crow's stinky toenail had lost its weight into Melvin's pathy, freckled skin. But this time, Melvin couldn't have been happier about it. Quickly, he reached back, untied his shoe, and slipped his foot out. The Melvin jumped out of Mr. Crow's window and slid down the flagpole with the Turbo Tola 2000 in all pursuit. Fortunately, Melvin's little scientist wrist wristwatch had a built-in DNA extractor. Melvin inserted the filthy tono into his watch and programmed the complete extraction procedure while the Turbo Tola 2000 chased him back through town. As Melvin ran screaming, his watch quickly pulverized and sonicated the toenail cells, removed the membrane lipids, proteins, and RNA, and purified and isolated a single strand of Mr. Crow's DNA. When Melvin reached his bedroom laboratory, he quickly fed the results into his Mecca computer, which identified a metallo-organic superpower substance and began replicating in a saline solution. The gel pro percolated slowly as it oozed into a glass breaker, a beaker. Hurry up, the dumb semi conservative genome replication device, shouted Melvin as the Trimber Toilet 2000 crashed through his bedroom wall. Gotcha! 
Ward's the loathsome laboratory. He scooped Melvin into his gigantic fist as his wet, slittery tongue slid back and forth against his pointed, proclaimed premolars. With one final desperate thrust, Melvin grabbed the beaker and took down the screen, glowing contents. The turbo toilet took down and popped Melvin into his mouth like a cocktail weenie and started to chew. His ferocious fangs tongue feverishly, but Melvin was tough and hard and surprisingly grisly. Then the turbo toilet took Delvin struggled to swallow a task that he found nearly impossible. With his gigantic metal fingers, he reached into his bowl and put out a mucus covered a little boy who surprisingly didn't have a scratch on him. The turbo toilet took Delvin gawked at Melvin and then found an astonishment. You're so immature, said Melvin. Chapter 6, Sanitize for your protection. Unfortunately, the epic fight that followed was way too violent and disturbing to appear in the children's book. The images and description would just be too terrifying. You'd have nightmares for weeks, trust me. So I have invited a guest illustrator, Timmy Swanson, age 4, to draw the action in a style that won't depict too much graphic detail. I've also asked his Nana and Gertrude, age 71, to describe the scene in her own general vocabulary. Take it away, Timmy and Nana. Thank you, dear. Whoa, let's see what's happening here. What? what oh, uh, my dad. That's horrible. I look like a little boy. Is, oh, dear. Now, what's he doing? Oh, dear me. This certainly is not appropriate at all. And now there's a robot shaped like a... Well, I'd rather not say. He's just doing such dreadful things, though. And... Oh, oh my, say, what kind of book is this? Oh, for heaven's sake, this is ridiculous. I've never been so offended in all my... Oh, I've seen just about enough... Oh, 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 dear. Timmy, stop drawing. Stop drawing this instant. No, Timmy, no. Chapter 7, The Incredibly Graphic Violence Chapter Part 1 in Fliporama. Featuring Lana and Timmy. I've had enough of this insanity. Shame on you. Shame on you all. Oh dear. Flip around my one. Oh my. Alright, just such an inappropriate comic and no. Oh for goodness sake. Chapter 8, Everybody Loves Melvin. When it was all over, the Turbo Toilet 2000 was dead and Melvin Neely was a hero. The mayor had the mayor had a big parade in honor of Melvin. Weird Ayayi Yankovic wrote a song about him. Even the vice president sent a letter of congratulations. Melvin Neely was known throughout the road as the little superpower talent who saved the road. Finally, said Melvin, I'm getting the respect I deserve. Chapter 9. With great power comes in a great big pain in the hiney. Melvin enjoyed being a superhero at first. With fun stopping runaway trains, rescuing lost children, and saving people from burning buildings. Whenever anybody needs help, all they had to do was lift their heads to the sky and cry out, Yo, Big Melvin! And Big Melvin would drop whatever he was doing and zip to the scene and save the day. It was all good at first until it started to get bad. You see, after a while, people started to abuse the system. System. They started crying out, Yo, Big Melvin, all the time, and they got old pretty quickly. Melvin would drop everything, throw on his cape, fly out the window, zip through the city, and arrive at the scene, only to find out that it wasn't an emergency at all. Usually, it was just someone who had misplaced her cell phone, or a kid who needed help with a video game cheat code, or some guy who had accidentally dropped his wallet in the toilet. It was a complete waste of Melvin's time, and the interruptions were beginning to drive him crazy. But the final straw came one evening as Melvin was doing a synchroton radiation experiment with his homemade oscillating field particle accelerator. Eleven months of research were finally about to pay off. The classrooms and electromagnets began to accelerate the hand run faster and faster through Melvin's homemade copper cyclone tubing. Soon, Melvin would be the first person on Earth to definitely prove to Higgs boson's existence and solve the mystery of everything. But then, with the supersonic eardrum, 
and we heard a cry for help from across the city. Quickly, Mimi shut down his experiment, which caused the particle accelerator to overheat. The resulting explosion blew a hole in his bedroom floor 40 feet deep, but Melvin didn't care. Somewhere in the city, a citizen needed his help. So he grabbed a smoldering cave from the pile of ashes that used to be his bedroom closet and flew to the scene of the emergency. When he arrived, he found a middle-aged woman screaming frantically out her apartment window. He opened Melvin, help, help, it's an emergency. What's wrong, Melvin asked desperately. Do these paths make me look fat at the lady? Chapter 10. It's a mad, 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 mad Melvin. Melvin was angry. Very, very angry. Since he became a superhero, he had no time to do his experiments. He had no time off, no sleep, no privacy, no time for anything. At that moment, Melvin made a decision. He decided for his sanity to quit the superhero business once and for all. But getting out was going to be a lot harder than it was getting in. Never needed to find a superhero to replace him. We made up his mind to locate Captain Underpants, bring him back to Pequa, and let him deal with all the halfless of superhero dumb. Find the Captain Underpants. It turns out, well, it's hard as Melvin had expected. Melvin knew that Trudian Haru was usually with Captain Underpants, and Sulu the Bionic Captain was usually with Trudian Haru. So, Melvin concluded, if I find Sulu, I should find Captain Underpants. Then Melvin had installed a GPS on Sulu's robotic endoskeleton. All Melvin had to do was to run a simple scan on his computer for the GPS device. At first, the scan found nothing, so Melvin broadened the search to include all locations and all times. Finally, when the search paid off, he found Sulu's last satellite, important location, down by the schoolyard 39 years in the future. That wasn't too hard, when we sneered, but bringing them all back to the present will be a little more complicated. Chapter 11 Dark Foreshadows When we went to his garage and climbed into his glow-in-the-dark time-traveling robo suit. quickly the suit powered up and started sink slinking and slithering toward the schoolyard as Melvin began the long journey to bring George Harvard and Captain Underpants the home where they belonged. After solving some surveillance photo issues at the bank, Melvin zapped himself to the future, fetched everyone, and brought them all back one year earlier to the exact time and place where they had departed on their journey in their last book. George Harwood and Captain Underpants had been through a lot in the past few days, but now it was as if they had never left at all. Everything was just as it had been. been. The Turbo Toilet 2000 wouldn't arrive on Earth for another two weeks, so Melvin's future as a superhero would never become reality. And nobody was happier about that than Melvin himself. I don't have to be a superhero anymore, from Melvin Napoli. I can finally follow my destiny, peace and quiet at last. But you still haven't told us why you brought us back, said George. Yeah, said Hara, what gifts? Oh, you'll find out, said Melvin with a foreboard and chuckle. In two weeks, you'll find out. Melvin unleashed a horrible, villainous laugh at his glow in the dark, her old squid suit began to shake and buzz. Soon, he and his tentacle time machine disappeared into a ball of electric light. Chapter 12, Heading Home Gurdjian Hara had no choice but to take Mr. Crab home. They brought him to his front door, got the key out from behind the bushes, and let him inside. Over to the kitchen sink and splashing water on your face, said George. Ah, uh, yeah, sir, said Captain Underpants. He did as he was told, and in no time at all, he was back to his grumpy old self. I wonder what's going to happen in two weeks, said Harold as he and George walked home. Aw, oh, I'm sure it's no big deal, said George. If Melvin can handle it, we can handle it. Soon, George and Harvey were back up in their treehouse. Carefully, they placed Cracker's egg on some soft pillows under a few desk lamps. There, said George, that should keep them warm and cozy. George and Harvey were dead tired. They hadn't slept in over 30 hours, and they'd been running for their lives most of that time. I need to see his nap, said Harold as he settled into his beanbag chair. Me too, said George. Even the road is exhausting. I'm still a little worried about that whole two weeks thing, said Haro. That sounds really bad. Relax, said George. There's nothing we can do about it now anyway. Let's try to stay out of trouble for the next two weeks, said Haro. The road is going to win. I don't want to be stuck in detention the whole time. 
Aw, oh, don't worry so much, said George. Besides, how much trouble can we get into in two weeks anyway? Chapter 13. Eleven minutes later. George, Harold, get down here right now. George and Harold opened their eyes wearily. They stumbled to the treehouse door and looked down. George's mom and dad and Harold's mom were all standing down in the yard looking very angry. The school called, George's dad said. They told us that you kids were in the class today. Oh, said George. We're dead, said Harold. Would you mind explaining what you've been doing all day? asked Harold's mom angrily. Green and Harold could hide the truth no longer. They decided to confess everything. You couldn't go to school today, said George. You have to save the earth from an evil, crazy guy who's riding around in a giant pair of robotic pants. Yeah, said Harold. He spent the last day traveling through time, running from dinosaurs, and teaching cavemen how to defend themselves. Very funny, shouted George's dad. If the kids think you can skip school and goof around all day, you're in for a big surprise. Green and Harold have never seen their parents so angry. The two boys spent the next five hours mooning lawns, weeding gardens, vacuuming houses, washing cars, dusting furniture, cleaning out garages, whitewashing fences, doing ditches, food and laundry, and talking, taking out garbage. It was exhausting work, but it was nothing compared to what was to come next. Chapter 14. What was to come next? George and Harold had never been so tired in all their lives. At 9.30 p.m., they ran a good night to each other and limped into their houses like zombies. Would you like a snack, said Horace's mother. No, Dan, he mumbled. He was too tired for a snack. He was tired to take a bath. He was tired to put his pajama on or take his shoes off. He didn't even have the energy to turn on his bedroom light. He just collapsed on top of his bed and fell asleep instantly. And two seconds later, the telephone rang. It was George. Or his mother brought the phone into the room and held it to his ear. I was too tired to even say hello. He just mumbled, hmm? I don't remember something, said George, panicking. Tomorrow is test day. I was bloodshot, eyes popped open, and he sat up straight. Oh no, Harold cried. It's all about, all about that. Me too, said George. I'm having major tests in all of our class tomorrow. We're going to have to stay up all night long and study. Chapter 15, to thine own self betrayed. When the sun rose the next day, George and Harold were still going through their spelling checklist. George was almost done studying. Harold still had to read 44 pages of his natural history textbook. Breakfast is ready, shouted George's staff from downstairs. George stumbled down exhaustedly and tried to smooth some waffles into his mouth. He missed. Meanwhile, Harold was sitting at his breakfast table when the burned out stupor, buttering a cereal and pouring milk on his toast. Did you get any sleep at all last night? asked Harold's mom. Okay, Harold answered. Harold's answer didn't make any sense, but he was the best he could do under the circumstances. Before long, George and Harold were ready for school. They met up as they did every school day in George's front yard. We're ready for all of our big tests today, asked George droopily. Pretty good, said Harold. He was so tired he couldn't even answer a simple question from his best friend correctly. Now how was he going to manage a day's worth of tests? Let's get this over with, George Moon. Wait, said Harold. I want to check on Cracker's egg before we go to school. Harold walked to George's background and hoisted himself up the ladder to the treehouse. Hurry up, said George. Harold did not answer. Hey, said George. We're going to be late. Harold did not come down. George climbed up the steps and peeked inside the treehouse. It was just as he had expected. Harold had fallen asleep at their desk. Hey, Harold, said George, shaking his front shoulder. Wake up, ma'am. We're going to be late for a test. Just five minutes, Simone and Harold. I just need to sleep for five minutes, please. Well, okay, but not a minute longer. George took his backpack off and set it against the tree door, treehouse door. And he plopped down his beanbag chair and looked at his pocket watch. 7.53 a.m. second hand was ticking away awfully slowly. I'm just going to close my eyes for a second, said George. Just for a few seconds. That afternoon, George yawned and stretched out as he rolled over in his beanbag chair. He glanced at his pocket watch again. 4.41 p.m. George closed his eyes and went back to sleep. Sleep. Suddenly, his eyes jawed open. Oh, no. George screamed hard awake. Awoke with the jump. We fell asleep, George cried. We slept through school. We slept through our tents. We slept through everything. Oh no, Harold wailed. We're dead, man. Game over. 
during Haru peeked out the treehouse window. Haru's mom was out in her garden. She was whistling a cheerful tune. That's strange, said Haru. Why didn't the school call her and tell her we were absent? I have no idea, said George. George and Haru climbed down from the tree house and walked over to the garden. How was school today? asked Haru's mom. Oh, same as always, I guess, said Haru. He really was guessing. George's mom heard them talking and came over. You didn't miss school today, did you? asked George's mom. Um, no, said George. Technically, George was telling the truth. Yeah, I didn't really miss school at all. Chapter 16, Super Secret Test Day. The next day, when George and Haru arrived at school, Mr. Crab was overjoyed to see them. He met them at the front door, shook their hands enthusiastically, and gave them both big sweaty hugs. This can't be good, George said. You're wrong, said Mr. Crumb. It's the best day ever. It's the day I've been waiting for since I met you two horrible people. Let's go. Let's all go to my office, shall we? I've got some refreshments. As they walked down the long hallway toward Mr. Crumb's office, several teachers patted Mr. Crumb on the back and congratulated him. The entire school staff seemed elated. We're doomed, said Harold. When they finally got to Mr. Crow's office, he plopped down into his chair and spun around a few times, giggling with glee. After a few minutes, George started to became, become impatient. I thought he said there were going to be refreshments, he said. Not for you, shouted Mr. Crow angrily. I slammed his fist on his desk. He opened his drawer, put out a warm diet soda, and popped it open. Then he leaned back to his chair and said loudly as he chuckled to himself. I just want to soak this moment in, he said with delight at fuzzy brown phosphoric ache and dribbled down his chin. We have really messed up this time, Mr. Crow laughed. Skip school on super secret test day. Super secret test day, said Haro. What does that mean? I thought you'd never ask, Mr. Crow said gleefully. You see, I've been looking for a way to separate you two kids for years now, but I never figured out how to do it until yesterday. It came to me in a flash of inspiration. Super secret test day. What's so secret about it? asked George. You should be asking. What's so super about it? said Mr. Krupp joyfully. Because it just might be the crowning achievement of my entire career. George and Harwa looked at each other nervously. Suddenly, the door opened and the school's math teacher, his calculator, entered the room. She sneered down at George and Harwa and poked her tongue out at them and as she walked by. And here are the figures you asked for, she said, handing Mr. Crub a large manila envelope. Dance, Anita, Mr. Crub said. He smelled the envelope like he was admiring the aroma of a gourmet meal. It was a real shame you boys missed school yesterday. Mr. Crow said, their teachers hated to do it, but they had to give you both zeros on all your tests. We study really hard, said Haru. Can't we take makeup tests? No, 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 Mr. Crow said, grinning evilly from ear to ear. There will be no makeup tests. Don't worry, said Haru, said George. We do really good on our final exams this year. We can bring our grades back up. Final exams have been canceled for this year, Mr. Crush briefly. Isn't that wonderful news? Then all our classmates will get seven more weeks of school with no homework, no quizzing, and no studying. Your grades for the whole school year have already been calculated. Oh no, said George. We're, we're going to flunk to fourth grade? Actually, it's worse than that, said Mr. Crush. The yellow teeth is lessening, and the grin so wide it seems to stretch beyond the boundaries of his face. Normally, you wouldn't get this information until summer vacation began, but I thought I'd be nice and show you your grades early. Isn't that fun? He opened a manila envelope and slid two report cards toward Jordan Aru. Quickly, the boys opened them up and stamped through them. His final grade for the year was 62.7%. Terrible grade to be sure, but still a passing grade. Jordan moves on to first grade next year. Harold, whose grades were not quite as good as George's, was luck lucky. Harold's final grade was 59.7%. He Harold had failed. Oh no, Harold moaned as his eyes began to fill with tears and going to flunk the fourth grade. Yeah, ain't that too bad, said Mr. Crub with the delighted twinkle in his eyes. He looked up at Miss Calculator and they both burst into fits of laughter. There's nothing you can do about it either, the calculator sneered. Two brass will be in different grades next year. We'll never see each other in school anymore. You have different teachers, different class, and different friends. Chapter 17. 
the idea. I can't believe they're going to separate us, said Harold, as the boys walked home from school that afternoon. George said nothing. He was thinking. He knew there was a way to solve this problem. I can't believe I have to spend an extra year at school, too, Harold moaned, trying not to cry. The worst part is that I actually studied. I noticed stuff. I could have probably got a straight beast if I had taken those tests yesterday. That's it, cried George confidently. We can fix this. But how, said Harold, they won't let us take makeup tests. Who says we have to take makeup tests, George replied. Let's take the real tests. Harold looked suspicious. What do you mean? he asked. Melvin said he kept his time traveling squid thingy in his garage. Right, said George. Let's borrow it and go back in time to yesterday morning. Then we can take those tests like we were supposed to. Problem solved. No way, Harold protested. Whenever we travel around the time, bad stuff happens. What could be worse than being in different grades next year, George countered. Do you really want to spend an extra year at that school? Hard to have an argument for that. Besides, said George, you're only getting back in time one day. How could anything bad happen in just one day? I guess you're right, said Harold. George and Harold turned around, then headed over to Melvin's house. Luckily, Melvin's garage door the garage door was open. Cautiously, the two boys sneaked inside and looked around. And there, standing in the corner beside a box of flags, were seven inch gangly trenches. Was the glow in the dark, time traveling robo sports suit. We shouldn't be doing this, Hart whispered. Gary trespassing and stealing. Hey, maybe we started this whole mess, George reminded Harold. We're just fixing it. Besides, we're not stealing, we're just borrowing. Against his better judgment, Harold helped hoist George up into the cockpit. Suddenly, the robo squid suit powered up and began to glow. A few moments later, the controls were all set. Okay, said George, let's go back in time and test take those dumb tests. He picked Harold up with one of his glowing tentacles, took a few steps forward and pressed the start button. The glow in the dark time traveling robo squid suit began shaking and sputtering and it zipped backwards in time 32 hours. A blinding ball of light flashed suddenly, and George and Haru arrived bright and early yesterday morning, just in time for school. As Haru helped George climb out of the cockpit, he noticed that there were now two glow-in-the-dark time-traveling robo squid suits. Hey, said Haru, how come there are two glow-in-the-dark time-traveling robo squid suits? Hmm, said George. I guess that one in the corner is the one from yesterday. When we went back in time, we created a duplicate time machine. Oh, said Haru, Melvin should thank us. Yeah, said George, that was very thoughtful of us. George and Haru ran back through the town as fast as they could. Soon they were scrambling up the steps of Jaramaro's elementary school. This feels weird, said George. I've never been so happy to go to school before. Or to take tests, said Haru. And indeed, it was a happy school day for George and Haru. They took all of their tests, did pretty well on most of them, and never had to deal with anything super or secret again. At least not until that afternoon. Chapter 18, Our Doppelgang. That afternoon, when George and Haru got home, they climbed up to the treehouse to check on Cracker's eggs. George tried to push the door open, but something was in the way. Hey, there's a backpack blocking the door, said George. He reached in and pulled it toward him. This, this is like my backpack. What's going on up there, asked Harold as George rummaged through the backpack. My papers, my books, my lunch from yesterday, said George. This is my backpack. It can't be, said Harold. You're wearing your backpack. George pushed the tree out the door open and looked inside. Oh no, said George. Harold climbed up next to George and looked inside the treehouse. They were sleeping at the table with Harold himself, and next to him sprawled out the snoring on his beanbag chair was George. I told you something bad would happen, cried George. Shh, said George, don't wake us up. I don't understand, Harold whispered. How come you're here? Well, it kind of makes sense, said George. We just went back in time to yesterday, right? Right, said Harold. Well, where were we yesterday, asked George. We are right up there, here in the treehouse, sleeping and... Oh, I get it, said Harold. This is us from yesterday. Yeah, said George. Remember how he accidentally created an extra robo squid? Dude, mm-hmm, said Harold. I guess he accidentally created an extra George and Aura, too. Perfect, said Harold sarcastically. Chapter 19, The Pact. 
While yesterday's George and Harold slept, George and Harold tried to figure out what to do next. How are we going to explain this to our parents? asked Harold. How are we going to explain this to, to ourselves? said George. Yesterday, George yawned and stretched as he rolled over in his beanbag chair. He glanced at his pocket watch, then closed his eyes to go back to sleep. Suddenly, his eyes shot open. Oh no! Yesterday, George screamed. Yesterday, Harold awoke with the gym. We fell asleep. Yesterday, George cried. We slept through school. We slept through our tests. We slept through. Hey, who are you guys? Yesterday, Harold rubbed his eyes and looked at his twin. I must be dreaming. He said, either that or I'm seeing Dubbo. Well, the truth is a long story. He and Harold told their yesterday selves what happened and quickly caught them both up on the events of the past three and a half chapters. Now, what are we supposed to do? Said Harold yesterday, George. We can't stay our parents, said Harold. So where are we all going to sleep? Asked yesterday, Harold. How are we all going to get enough food? She said yesterday, George. And clean clothes, said Harold. Everyone was beginning to panic except for George, who had been deep in thought for a while. George didn't seem worried at all. In fact, a devilish grin was beginning to spread across his face. And no, George said, maybe you're looking at this thing the wrong way. Maybe this is a good thing. A good thing, cried yesterday Harold incredulously. Yeah, said George. We always said there's never enough time to do what we want to do. So let's take shifts. Me and Harold will start going to school and doing our homework on even number of days. And you guys will go to school and do homework on odd number of days. Yeah, but what do we do while we, you guys are at school? Asked yesterday, George. Whatever you want, said George. Hang out in the treehouse, play video games, make comics, watch monster, watch monster movies. It doesn't matter. You guys get to relax and take the day off every other day. I get it, said yesterday, George, smiling devilishly. Then you guys can take the day off while we're at school and stuff. Yeah, said George, just think of the possibilities. I don't know, said Harold and yesterday Harold at the same time. Don't worry, said George, it'll be great. We'll have twice as much fun as normal and only half the work. Yeah, said yesterday George, what could possibly go wrong? Chapter 20, Shift Workers. Since today was an even numbered red weekday, it was decided that yesterday George and yesterday Harold would go to school the next day. So the yesterday boys said goodbye and headed down to their respective homes to eat, do homework, and prepare for the next day at school. George and Harold were ready for a night turned on a monster movie, and the two friends settled into their beanbags chair for some well deserved RR. Fortunately, they had enough juice boxes. Things on cupcakes and fruit roly floss to last them for a while. Around 9.30 p.m., George called Pequa Pizza Place and ordered two calzones, some cheesy breadsticks, and two liter bottles of ice-cold root beer. The boys waited in George's driveway, so the delivery guy wouldn't ring the doorbell. Soon, the two friends were enjoying the finest cardioidrace money could buy in the quiet comfort of their cozy treehouse. This is the life, said George, as he pressed play on the horror movie masterpiece Baby Blob 2. The squishing Harold, who was usually cautious in situations like this, had to admit it. They was the indeed the life. Chapter 21, Problems. The next morning, George and Harold woke up late. Ah, it's nice to sleep in for a change, isn't it, said George. Yeah, said Harold, but I gotta pee. This was something that George and Harold hadn't thought about. Usually, they would just climb down a ladder and run next to their houses to use the bathroom. But George and Harold's moms both worked from home, and they would not be happy to see the boys running in and out of the house on a school day. Fortunately, empty two-liter bottles come in very handy for these situations. But as they poured the contents of their emergency urinals out the window, both boys knew the solution wouldn't work for long. Our food is running low, said Harold, and I spent all of my allowance on those calzones last night. No problem, said George. We'll make a comic book, sell it on a playground and school, and use the money to buy all the junk we need. We can even buy one of those portable camping toilet thingies. We're not supposed to go to school today, said Harold. Actually, we're not supposed to go to our classes today, George clarified. As long as we're not in the same place as our doubles, we should be fine. So George and Harold cleared the space after desk and began working on their newest comic book. It was called Chapter 22, Super Dapper Baby 2 and a Half. 
by George and Harold. Uh, by George Beard and Harold Hutchins. One morning at the Hoskinen's house, everybody was watching TV. When suddenly, we interrupt this show for breaking news. PD the cat has escaped from cat jail, and he has found revenge on Super Dapper Baby and Dapper Dog. That's terrible. I know. We've got to be very careful. PD is going to try and trick us. We must be on the lookout for the test evil ways. Two seconds later, ding dong. Oh, I wonder who that could be. Yes, hello, I'm PT the cat. I'm the world's most famous this clown. Can Billy and Dapper Dog be in my big paradise? So you can ride on this big float I made, Super Dapper Baby. Then the big parade started. But then, is everyone having fun? Yeah, good, because one, I, because I have one last surprise. He took off his nose, he took off his makeup, he took off his wig and hat, and he took off his clothes. Guess who? Petey the Cat was really Petey the Cat. Get it? It's a play on words. Get it? Um, uh, nah, nope. Never mind, give me money, buff. So then, hey look, it's Petey. Let's get him, okay. But hey, I'm stuck. Me too. It's cause the baby food is really a robo baby. War. Our heroes were stuck in the powerful grip of the mighty robo baby. Petey collides, wa collected Wallace and Prince from the crowd. Fill her up. While robo baby destroyed the city. War. Wow, who will save us? When then Darwin got an idea. He ran over to robo baby and climbed up to him. Then Dogman scratched and scratched and scratched. Soon Dogman's fleas flew off and they landed in Redwood Baby Stamper. Then I'm free, me too. Triple flip arama. Dogman had a little wish, his fleas were white as snow and everywhere the Redwood Baby went. The fleas were sure to go. Bye bye, the end. But then. PD had and another revenge to do him for himself to be continued. Chapter 23, Dream a Little Dream of Us. Hey, that comic turned out pretty good, said Harold. Yeah, not too shabby, said George. Let's go to school and make copies of it. What if somebody sees us, said Harold. Don't worry, said George. I've got it all figured out. So George and Harold headed to school and speaked into the office. In no time at all, they were running off copies of their new comic book and stapling them together. Things were going very well until the school secretary, Miss Anthrope, came back from her lunch break. What are you kids doing in my office, Miss Anthrope yelled. They're not in your office, said George with a mischievous smile. They're dreaming. Dreaming, said Miss Anthrope. Yeah, and I can prove it, said George. Score teacher Miss Ribble on the intercom. She'll tell you that we're both in class now. In class, said Miss Anthrope. Yes, the George. Obviously, we can't be in two places at the same time. So this has to be a dream, right? Miss Anthrope was suspicious. She grabbed the microphone on the intercom and con contacted Miss Ribble through. Miss Ribble, she said, where is our George and Harry right now? Why? They're right here in my classroom, Miss Ribble replied through the speaker. Oh, really, said Miss Anthrope. Of course, said Miss Ribble. They've been here all day. Miss Anthrope was stubbed. She got a sneaky idea. All right, she said. If they're really in your classroom, then send them both to your office right now. Okay, said Miss Ribble. Miss Anthrope turned and looked at Jordan Hart with a yellowish, snarly grin. I don't know what kind of trick you kids are trying to pull, she said. You can't fool me. Suddenly, Yesterday, Jordan, yesterday, Harold walked into the office. Miss Andrew looked at them and screamed. And she looked at Jordan and Harold and screamed again. Her head made a swishing sound as it swiveled back and forth between Jordan and Harold and yesterday, Jordan, yesterday, Harold. See, the George, I told you there was a dream. Uh, you're right, cries Miss Andrew. It all seems so vivid, but I must be dreaming. Of course you are, said George. And why should you have wasted a perfectly good dream hanging around the office? That's a good point, said Miss Andrew. And why bother wearing such tight, restricting clothes? After all, it's my dream. I can do whatever I want. Now, wait a minute, said Harold. But it was too late. Miss Andrew 
hoisted her dress over her head, ripped it off, and threw it out the window. Wee! she yelled. Dreaming is fun. Then she ran away, laughing her head off, and slammed the office door behind her. What are you guys doing here? said yesterday, George sternly. This is our day to be at school. Ran out of food, and we needed to buy some supplies, said George. So we made a new comic to sell on the playground. Yesterday, Hara walked over to the copy machine and inspected the new comic. But how many did you make? he asked. About 200, said Harold. Well, leave them with us, said yesterday Harold. We'll throw them at recess today and bring the money to the tree out after school. Yeah, said George, but we guys need to get out of here, yesterday George interrupted. If anybody else catches us together, we'll all be in big trouble. All right, all right, said George. Get out now, shouted yesterday George angrily. All right, said George, gee whiz. Yesterday, George and yesterday, Haro scooped up the comics in their arms and left the office in a huff. Man, said George, today was supposed to be our day to have fun, but he won't let us. I know, said Haro, who do we think we are? We can't tell us what to do, said George. I'm not the boss of me. Me neither, said Haro. I'm going to do what I want, even if I don't want, if, even if I don't want me to. That's telling yourself, said George. Chapter 24, Twin Franks. George and Hara went out to into the hallway and started switching the letters around the bulletin boards. Okay, candy bar fun way there to can't barf day. Soon they were spotted by two teachers. Hey, Mr. Meaner Bart, what do you think what do you kids think you're doing? Actually, we're not doing anything, said George. You guys are dreaming. It took even less effort to persuade Ms. Me Mr. Meaner and Miss Labor that they were dreaming too. Once they looked at Miss Ribble's classroom window and saw yesterday, Drew and yesterday, Harrow sitting in their seats, they were convinced. There can't be two Drew and two Harrows, cried Mr. Meaner. So this has to be a dream. That's right, said Harrow. You can do anything you want, just don't take off your clothes, man. Oops, too late. Mr. Meaner tore off down the hallway, laughing like a crazy person and singing Izzy with the spider at the top of his lungs. Mrs. L Ms. Laver headed straight for the teacher's lounge, where she yanked open the refrigerator and started stuffing her face with everyone's lunches. Hallelujah, she cried. I can't eat anything I want and not can wait. Hey, that's our food, cried Mr. Directed. No, it's not, giggled Miss Laver. This is a dream. Check it out for yourself. With a mouthful of tuna salad and chocolate chip cookies, she led them all down to Miss Ribble's classroom window. Soon they were convinced too. George and Harvard watched in shock as teacher after teacher car to going crazy. Mr. Meaner bought in a brought in a garden hose and started spring down the hallway with soapy water. It's the world's biggest slip and slide, he cried. By the time Mr. Crook came out of the teacher's bathroom, nearly all of the staff, including the janitor, the lunch ladies, and most of the parent volunteers were laughing their heads off, throwing soap stuff at each other, and flipping and sliding down to halfway in their giant underwear. What the heck is going on here, Mr. Crook screamed. That's the greatest dream ever, cried Miss Dakin. She brought, she brought Mr. Crook over to Miss Ribble's classroom window and showed him the proof. But when Mr. Crump saw that there were now two George and two Harrow, his reaction was a bit different from the other adult reaction. He tried to speak. He tried to convince himself that he was dreaming. He tried to say something. But all that came out was ba 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 hop hop ba hop ba wah wah. Chapter 25. 12 Days of Chaos. It didn't take long before the cops showed up. They attempted to restore order, order, but things didn't go very well. You can either do this. The easy way or the hard way, shouted Officer Mac McWigley. Let's do it the fun way, cried Miss Fed as she yanked Officer McWigley's pants down around the same ghost. I've got an idea, a good idea, said George. What, asked Harold. Run, said George. By the time it was all over, the entire staff of Drawers Elementary School was in jail. The charges ranged from indecent exposure and rest resisting. A resisting arrest to reckless endangerment and pantsing a police officer. The cops didn't quite know what to do with Mr. Crook, though. He hadn't really done anything wrong. He just stood there in the same spot for hours and hours saying blah 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 over and over again. So it was decided that she should be admitted into the Peepa Valley home for the reality challenge and remain unchanged for nearly two weeks. During Harlow and the twins spent the next 12 days being very careful. 
Great job, show yesterday, George Angrily. Our teachers are in jail and Mr. Krebs is in the goof house. These past two weeks have been a total disaster. Two weeks, said Harold inquisitively. Yeah, yesterday, George continued. In the past two weeks, you guys have... No, wait, Harold interrupted. Well, this is something bad supposed to happen in two weeks. George, yesterday, George, and yesterday, Harold all thought back to when with me these cry, cry thick warning in chapter 11. Oh, yeah, they all simultaneously, the four boys looked around them. They checked the horizon. They sniffed the air. They put their ears to the floor and listened. Nothing. There's no sign of any trouble. Huh? The George, I guess nothing bad is going to happen after all. Suddenly, a fireball shot out from behind the clouds. Then came an echoing eardrum piercing sound of relentless terror. It was a laugh, a horrifying, sinister stomach churn and laughed that the boys had not turned for many months. A laugh that they hoped they would never hear again. Oh, oh, the, the George is redoomed, the, the, cried the horrors. Chapter 26, he's Johnny. The Terrible Tola 2000 zipped across the roof, tossing his homing rocket scooter, laughing ferociously as a trail of choking smoke filled the afternoon sky. Everyone screamed, everyone cried, everyone hid, everyone did this except for Jordan Howard and their drilly distressed duplicates. The four boys ran as fast as they could to the Pequa Valley home for the reality challenge. There was only one person who could stop this horrifying beast and he was locked away in the goof house. The four boys dashed through the sanitarium's front door and slid across the freshly waxed door to the reception desk. We need to see Mr. Krubs, cried George, almost out of breath. He's a patient here. Sorry, said the nurse, but patients can't have visitors with a doc without a doctor's permission. But he can save the role, cried Harold. He's Captain Underpants. Sure he is, said the nurse sarcastically. Listen, bub, we currently have nine patients who claim to be Captain Underpants. We also have four Wonder Woman, seven Albert Einstein, and one Elvis Presley. Well, can we at least talk to him? Asked George yesterday, Harold. No, said the nurse. Nobody talks to the king. Not Elvis, said George angrily. Mr. Krebs. Oh, said the nurse. I'm sorry, but no. Rass, right yesterday, Harold. Captain Underpass is stuck in the goof house. You can't bust him out, said George. But I know somebody who can. Follow me. Frantically, the boys ran back across the city. Chapter 27. The squad's crazy. George had an idea, and he needed everyone's help to pull it off. George grabbed some cardboard boxes from his garage. Drew found some white spray print in his garage. Yesterday, George and yesterday, Harwood each grabbed a barbecue grill from their backyards. With a little in ingenuity and a lot of duct tape, the four boys constructed two surprisingly convincing talking toilet costumes. George and Harold climbed into the boxes and wheeled themselves awkwardly into town. Soon they came face to face with the Turbo Tola 2000. A yum yum eat em up, said George, opening and closing the barbecue grill lid with every syllable. Yeah, eat em up and stuff, said Harold, doing the same thing with the sled. Hey, cried the Turbo Tola 2000. I thought you guys were dead. I'm not quite dead, said George. It's just a flood wound. Yeah, me too, said Harold. Good, said the Turbo Tola 2000. You can help me look for those two kids who messed up all of our plans a few months ago. Um, okay, said George, but what about that ball guy with the cape and the underwear? I'll get him later, said the Turbo Tola 2000. Please, I want to find those two meddling kids. I really think you should find that underwear guy first, said Harold. Yeah, said George. He said some really mean things about you. Oh, we did, did he? shouted the Turbo Tola 2000. What did he say? Um, said George, he said you're so fat, you have to put your belt on with the boomerang. Boomerang, yeah, said Harold, and you're so dumb, you tried to conserve toilet paper by using both sides. Enough, screamed the Turbo Toilet 2000. Where was he? Right this way, said Harold. Chapter 28, are smashed into the cuckoo's nest. The Turbo Toilet 2000 followed George and Harold back to the sanitarium. He marched through the front doors and headed toward the restricted area. The nurses screamed and ran for safety. Quickly, George grabbed the intercom, turned up the volume, and started snapping his fingers into the microphone. The sound of the fingers snapping echoed through the hallways of the Pequa Valley home of her the reality challenge after Turbo Toilet 2000 crashed from room to room. 
Mr. Krebs lapping commandos for nearly two weeks suddenly began to change. First, a mischievous tinkle gleamed into his eyes. The giant smile spread across his face. Suddenly, he ripped off his straight jacket, threw off his pajamas, and grabbed a curtain from a nearby window. Captain Underpass was back, and the battle of the century was about to begin. Chapter 29, the, incredib the Incredibly Graphic Violent Chapter Part 2 in Fliporama. Hello, it's nice to beat you. The Turbo Toilet 2000 now tries to defeat Captain Underpants, but he defeats him back. Thank you very much. All swell that ends swell. Captain Underpants keeps destroying the Turbo Toilet 2000. Chapter 30, Tears of a Commode. Let's that be a lesson for you, the Captain Underpants gallantly after Turbo Toilet 2000 cried and cried. Whoa, said George, I'm glad that's over with. Yeah, said Haru, that ended up being a lot easier than I thought it would be. At that precise moment, a single tear dropped from the quivering eyeballs of the Turbo Toilet 2000 flew through the air and landed on Captain Underpants' face. Splash! Suddenly, our hero's expression began to change. The sparkle disappeared from his eyes, his posture deflated, and his goofy grin morphed into a scowling grimace. What the heck is going on here, Mr. Krebs yelled. Uh-oh, said Harold. Mr. Krebs turned and saw the ginormous turbo toilet 2000 blubbering behind him. Ah, the frightened from the bush street. It's a monster, and he ran and sent away, screaming his head off. The Turbo Toilet 2000 wasn't sure that was what was going on and decided to chase Mr. Krebb and see what happened. Soon, the, the, the Leviathan Laboratory concerned Mr. Krebb and scooped him up in his mighty robotic fist. I give up, cried Mr. Krebb. I surrender. Please don't hurt me. Jeez, said the Turbo Toilet 2000. That ended up being a lot easier than I thought it should be. I just need to find those two annoying kids. Mr. Krebb freaked up a little. Uh, what two annoying kids, he asked. Well, said the Turbo Toilet 2000. One of them had a flat top and a tie, and the other one were teachers and had a bad haircut. Hey, I know those kids, said Mr. Crow sadly. I even know where to live. Really, said the Turbo Toilet 2000. Then what are we waiting for? Come on, my two toilet minions. Behold, my tyrannical relation is at hand. The crow pointed to when the Turbo Toilet 2000 marched off towards Groot and Harold's houses. Uh oh, said George. We're doomed again, said Harold. Chapter 31 The Re Retaliation. The Turbo Tola 2000 marched with Grooges and Harwood houses, smashing through buildings, pushing over cars, and leaving a smoldering path of destruction behind them. Grooges and Harwood tried to keep up, but the Turbo Tola 2000 left them trailing behind. Oh, no, cried Harwood. He's heading for our houses, and there's no way to warn ourselves. It didn't matter, however, because yesterday Grooges and yesterday Harwood could hear the Turbo Tola 2000 coming from miles away. I think he's heading toward us, cried yesterday, George. But how will we know where to find us? Said half yesterday, Harrow. Turn left that vine tree, said Mr. Krebs. The kids live on this block. I bet they're hiding up in that treehouse of theirs. Yesterday, George and yesterday, Harrow saw the Turbo Toilet 2000 heading for their backyard. They could feel the earth shake under each stomp of his massive metal feet. Yesterday, George locked the door to the treehouse. Yesterday, Harrow hid under the desk. Okay, said Mr. Krebs. I've led you to those two kids you were looking for. Can I go now? Sure, said the Turbo Tola 2000. You can go right in here. She shoved the three friends up into his mouth and flushed his little handle. Mr. Krebs shrieked in terror as he spun around in a thrilling whirlpool of saliva. Then the Turbo Tola 2000 swallowed hard and Mr. Krebs was flushed away with the gurgling glug glug glug. The Turbo Toilet 2000 slammed against the tree with its massive metallic shoulder. Yesterday, George and yesterday, Haro went flying. The bookshelf fell over, comics flew everywhere, and Cracker's eggs wobbled around precariously on the desktop. Get down here, you meddling kiss, screamed the Turbo Toilet 2000 as he smashed into the tree house tree once more. Yesterday, George and yesterday, Haro went flying again. The three eggs teetered per perilously back and forth at the edge of the table. I'm warning you, cried the Turbo Toilet to Dowd. Give up now and I will make you suffer. He plowed into the 
tree a third time. This time the window smashed, the TV toppled over, and Cranker's eggs flew off of the table. Yesterday, George and yesterday, Harold leave for the eggs. No, Cranky yesterday, Harold, as the three purple and orange speckled eggs flew through the air. They hit the floor and shattered with a terrible crash. Chapter 32, surprise, surprise, surprise. As the tree house swayed violently from side to side, yesterday, George and yesterday, Harold shifted frantically through the broken eggshell fragments. Suddenly, yesterday, Harold's hand felt something warm and fuzzy. Carefully, he pulled it out from the broken eggshell pieces. It was a, a, a yesterday. Harold wasn't quite sure what it was. What the heck is this thing? Cried yesterday. Harold, as the tiny fuzzy creature wrapped its wing around him and looked up lovingly into his eyes. Yesterday, George pulled two more fuzzy winged creatures out of the shell fragments and stared at them in disbelief. This, this can't be! He cried. The tree house shook wildly, and yesterday George and yesterday Harold went flying again. The three tiny creatures happily wiggled their way up to the boys' faces and started licking their cheeks. The turtle toilet took down and climbed up the side of the tree and tore the door off his hands. He reached in and grabbed yesterday George and yesterday Harold in this mighty metal can. If gosh, and now were the preposed dress proclaimed predator as he shook the two boys back and forth. Quickly, they got to their feet and excitedly flapped their wings. They weren't sure what was happening, but it seemed like fun. The turbo toilet took down and jumped down from the treehouse and reached the two boys tightly in his fist. Finally, I shall avenge my fallen allies and take my place as the supreme leader of the earth, he shouted. The three tiny creatures fled her down the yesterday Jordan, yesterday Haru, wagging their little tails with excitement. But when they saw the looks of terror on the boy's face, they realized that this was not a game. Quickly, the three creatures took action and began circling the turbo toilet to jalon like mosquitoes. Then they each took turns zooming in close and taking quick bites out of him with their bionic jaws. Ouch! cried the turbo toilet to jalon as he desperately swatted at the swooping creatures. What the heck are those things? Another one dived in, bit him on the forearm, and yanked out of his steel bone. Hey, cut that out, screamed the frustrated friend as he released the boys and began swatting at the flying beasties with all his might. The strange furry creatures grasped the triple toilet to thousand by his lid and shoulders and lifted him off the ground, flapping their wings hard as they could. They carried the villainous lavatory higher and higher into the air. They party and I want to fly if I want to. Okay. Or he was destroying the turbo toilet to thousand. Soon they were more than a half mile up in the sky. Let me go, let me go, words the terrified turbo toilet to thousand. This turned out to be a poor choice of words because the three fuzzy creatures did exactly that. All at once they released their grip on the evil robotic behemoth and sent him tumbling downward. Faster and faster he flowed through the clouds, spinning out of control and screaming in terror. Chapter 33, three, to make a long story short, Kablamo! Chapter 34, welcome back, Krep! The Turbo Toilet 2000 that smashed into a vacant parking lot and exploded with a sonic boom that shattered nearly every window in the city. When the smoke finally cleared, Mr. Cross sat alone in the center of the impact points, surrounded by mango, meadow, and jagged chunks for, for clang. For, Killing. Everything around him had been destroyed, but Mr. Crest surprisingly was unharmed. His superpowers had protected him. Soon the two cops arrived at the scene. Are you okay, Dia? I guess so, said Mr. Crest. This must be one of those crazy nightmares I keep having. Oh, great, said Miss Officer Mac Wiggly. It looks like we've got another naked school teacher who thinks he's dreaming. Let's lock him up with the others, said the chief of the police. Chapter 35 Hamster Adoptos. George and Haru finally made it home just as the three furry creatures were returning to the treehouse. Yesterday, George and yesterday, Haru told them what had happened and how the strange fuzzy creatures inside Cracker's eggs had saved the earth from total destruction. 
What are these things anyway? asked George. They kind of look like a cross between a hamster and a pterodactyl. That's hard. Ew, said George. That means that Zulu and Crackers were ew. But that doesn't make sense, said Harold. How could a mammal made with a reptile? Ew, cried George again. I mean, unless Zulu's DNA was mutilated when he morphed with the bionic endoskeleton, said Harold. Ew, cried George again. I suppose a mammal with mutated genes might be able to breed with the prehistoric reptile. Harold speculated. What part of ew don't you understand? shouted George. Sorry, said Harold. Soon the four friends and their three new pets were back up in their treehouse. They all worked together to clean up the mess. Then the two Harolds made the best for the baby hamster adoptus out of few boxes while the two Georges thought up names for them. Let's call the girl Dawn, said George. What about the two boys, said yesterday Harold? Orlando and Tony, said yesterday George. Harold wrote the new pet names on the shoe box bed, but he still seemed perplexed. Are you still trying to figure out how we ended up with three half a turtle doctor, half bionic counter pets? asked George. Yeah, sort of, Harold replied. You're thinking too much, said George. Listen, if you look too closely at these stories, you're gonna fall apart completely. What you think this is, Shakespeare? I guess you're right, said Harold. Of course I'm right, said George. Just go with them, man. Chapter 36. All's well that ends poorly. Well, that was a satisfying ending, said yesterday hard out of Tech Tony, Orlando went down into the bits. What do you mean, satisfying, said George? The city is destroyed, our teachers are in jail, there are four of us. And our there and our three mutant pets think with their moms. Oh yeah, said yesterday Harold. I guess there are a lot of loose ends in the story. Oh, said Harold. That means can only mean one thing. What? asked yesterday Harold. Oh, oh, what? asked yesterday George. Another sequel, said Harold. Oh no, why George and yesterday George? Why George and yesterday George? Here we go again, moaned Harold and yesterday Harold. And this is the 11th novel. Only one novel left, guys. I hope I can see you there. Thank you for the support. Thank I really appreciate it. I hope I can see you there. Thank you. Peace.